The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to our webinar presented by Data Conversion Laboratory and Vassant Systems. I'm Suzanne Meskin of Vassant Systems and I'll be moderating this event. Today, our mini panel of speakers from these partner companies will answer a collection of questions that you, our audience, have asked regarding the value of structured content. Based on the number of questions we received during the registration, this is definitely a hot topic and we really appreciate your participation in this webinar. Now, in order to keep it to an hour, we've chosen the questions most relevant to today's topic. If we don't address your questions, we will address them in future webinars next year, so be sure to register for our 2013 events as well. If you have any additional questions, please submit them in the question panel, and we'll try to answer them if we have a few minutes at the end of the webinar. Our first panelist is Jim Brasselman, Director of Business Development for Vassant Systems. He has held senior level positions in sales and business development in the sustainability and energy and EHS information systems industries. Jim previously worked at SafeTech Compliance Systems as the Vice President of Partners and Strategy, where he was responsible for driving significant new top line revenue opportunities through partnership relationships and penetration into new markets. Jim holds a BA in English Literature from Gettysburg College. Our second panelist is Linda Marone of Data Conversion Laboratory. She is their Vice President of Sales and Marketing and manages client support activities and strategic partnerships. Linda has more than 25 years of experience in digital media, web-based solutions, and data management services. Now I'll turn it over to Jim and Linda to give you their 30-second commercial of their respective companies. Linda? Thank you, Suzanne. Yes, I think we need the uh, slide forwarded. There, there we go. Uh, this is Jim Brasselman. Thank you, Suzanne. I appreciate it. And Linda, good to join you on the call today, along with Thank all you, the uh, uh, webinar attendees. Uh, a little bit about Vassant Systems. We are uh, here to help you organize your business assets manage your productivity through the deployment of our component content management system. We've got over 60 years in the information management and publishing industry, so pretty long legacy in this space and have seen a lot. Uh, headquartered in beautiful South Central Pennsylvania, uh, we call it Middle Earth here, it's very nice, it's like a rock wall painting. Uh, We've got clients uh, at over uh, several Fortune 1000 companies, as well as smaller organizations. So I don't want any of uh, the uh, attendees to think that we are only suited for uh, the big and the complicated. We also can serve very well for folks in smaller or mid-sized organizations with content and publishing requirements. And four times we've been named to the eContent 100 list of the most important companies in the digital content arena. And Linda, if you can share with us a little bit about uh, DCL. Terrific, Jim. Thank you. Glad to team with you today. Um, Data Conversion Laboratory, we're very proud to have been announced uh, yet another year for as also one of eContent Magazine's top 100 companies in the digital content space. Uh, certainly proud to join uh, the other 99 and certainly Vassant, our value partner. We bring more than 30 years of experience providing electronic document conversion services, uh, meeting the needs of technology today and in the future. Needless to say, the services we provided 30 years ago are quite different than the, the services we are providing today. So as new devices and new opportunities come to the marketplace, Data Conversion Laboratory um, is there to help service your needs. We offer a range of services, as you can see listed on the screen. We work across all vertical industries, and uh, really there's very little uh, in the, the way of formats that we cannot uh, touch, and uh, both on the front end and the back. So 
really look forward to working with you all at some point in the very near future. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's get to the questions. Um, our format today, we have taken those questions that you've submitted and uh, put them on slides just for you to reference. I'll read the question and then I'll have our panelists answer those questions. So we'll start with question number one. We publish our documentation in different languages. How will converting from our current document-based approach to one based on content reuse and managing content in a CMS help us with our translation needs? Uh, Suzanne, this is Jim. I'd like to take a a stab at at least some high-level observations on this topic. Uh, with the use of a component content management solution, uh, we've seen some pretty positive results in terms of uh, reducing translation cycles, i.e. the amount of time it takes uh, to manage translation processes uh, by pretty dramatic percentages. Uh, also, we've seen our clients able to uh, accrue some pretty dramatic cost savings in translation uh, fees, uh, in particular when they are able to not retranslate the same content repeatedly, but rather only uh, translate uh, their content once and then use it many, many times. And the last point I'd like to make is that if you get your content right and pro structured properly, it uh, provides some consistency in the way you interact with your translation provider or providers, whether that's an in-house resource, third-party resource, it doesn't matter. And you can start to deliver consistent uh, content to them for them to speed their processes and getting back to you, your translated content. Linda, do you have anything? Yeah, I mean, I completely concur, obviously. Uh, you know, the goal of structured content is really to create a standardized approach to managing and delivering content in any language to any individual, either uh, customer, internal folks, uh, various sales people, marketing, whoever it might happen to be, in any language that uh, they so needed to be in. So if you think about it from the standpoint of this is your goal, it makes it a lot easier to begin the process and it's you know basically building technical terms into the metadata so you can make a change once and have it implemented across the full document set uh, versus having to go back in and try to find where all of the uh, occurrences are and so on and so forth. Also by chunking content you can translate only what is needed for that particular group or application. So you can only imagine the considerable amount of time that you can save in that regard. Um, and lastly, there are more tools available for you to use, um, not only for translation, but for every aspect of really maintaining that consistent approach to delivering the content. Excellent. Okay, great. Question two. We're in the early stages of investigating a move to DITA and component content management. Our CFO will be asking for a solid ROI estimates. How can we identify all the areas for savings and provide an accurate ROI estimate? <laughs> That's a great question. It's a, it's a recurring question that I'm sure Linda, you, and I know we hear all the time. Let me take a stab uh, at a pretty high level to be as helpful as possible uh, with regard to this. First of all, there are multiple industry groups analysts, consultants available and out there in the world, LinkedIn groups and others uh, that have uh, some real life data accumulated about the potential savings and return on investment for both structuring your content and managing it more efficiently with a component content management approach. There's an, uh, what's interesting is that uh, we did a little research and uh, found extraordinary consistency in the analysis results in terms of the potential for ROI. Now, I am very reluctant to throw numbers out, but I will say that on average, and for an, an average uh, density of content requirement uh, and average size organization, you can start to approach 35 to 40 percent uh, cost savings on your total content management spend by utilizing these techniques 
and tools appropriately. And that's the key. You've got to do it appropriately, and you've got to insist on getting good results. Uh, otherwise, you, it's very easy to squander money on this project like any other. So, Linda, do you have any thoughts on that? You know, I, I definitely do. And, you know, I agree on, on all the points. And interestingly enough, it also is that uh, the topic of ROI happened to be the topic of many of our questions that we received. So clearly this is yes. on your minds. And certainly one topic that may need to have its own webinar at some point uh, to help you walk through all of the areas that you need to consider to build out uh, you know, a clear and solid uh, estimate for your particular organization. But what we typically will recommend is that you create a wish list of sorts uh, by which you build out a complete list of all of the benefits you hope to achieve. By looking at everything that you, if you had the opportunity to, to do, would improve process, would improve efficiencies, and all of the things you're looking for, it's a lot easier then to begin to identify what is missing in your current process throughout your organization. Um, it also becomes more clear as to the costs that are involved now, as well as the hidden costs that can drain an organization. And I have to tell you, you're going to have to be really brutally honest with yourselves, and hopefully your colleagues will be brutally honest with you as well in really beginning to identify what those hidden costs are because I, I, under, I will promise you, you'll, you'll be amazed at the drain that currently your process is, is that, costing you. Exactly. Current operations, it is, it is really amazing. That helps you Absolutely. Uh, kind of highlight the, the cost of doing nothing as well. Is, is, exactly, exactly. and it, it also, Jim, it involves, you know, what, uh, when I have to go over and manage this part of my documentation, what happens to my real job, you know? But some of the things that you will want to consider is really like things like lost market share due to not having the proper, um, you know, a flexible content built and ready for the marketplace. Uh, lost productivity, translation process, current workflow, um, future authoring processes, marketing requirements, sales support, customer support. I spoke to a, um, a client recently, by the way, that is a medical equipment manufacturer, and they basically said the savings on the customer support alone paid for much of their strategy that they put into place. So, you know, I think at, in any one of these areas, you're going to begin to develop um, uh, the plan that you need. And certainly, uh, you know, we'll be happy to work with anyone offline as well to, to help you identify uh, what is of every piece of the pie, if you will. So, Suzanne? Okay. Question three. We have gone through a content conversion in the past. We had quality issues with what was delivered that put our project timeline at considerable risk. We are now considering moving to DITA. Should we tackle the conversion ourselves this time around? I chuckled too, Jim, because you don't know how many calls we receive where clients are in the midst of either a self-conversion or another vendor's conversion process. Timelines are being drained like crazy, and we need to jump in and fix this. So to answer this question quickly, because I do think, you know, again, it is one that um, is highly dependent on the particular organization as to what is your best process moving forward. But assuming that you worked with an outside vendor previously, I think you really have to identify what went wrong. I can pretty much tell you now what it is, but I would sound very self-serving, so I'm going to remain, uh, keep, keep those thoughts to myself. But some of the issues uh, to be considered before you begin a conversion, whether it is on your own or certainly through a vendor, um, 
is, you know, what kind of planning did we put into place? More than likely, in this case, it was very poor. Uh, what was our content like going in? If it's messy and there's a ton of redundancies, you're going to have messy, redundant outputs. Um, so we work with our clients to get a lot of that cleanup done on the front end. Um, actually, our, the front end of our process is so fine-tuned and so multifaceted that by the time we actually get to the conversion, there really is very little opportunity for errors to occur. So that front end is, is critical. I would, I would guesstimate that uh, there are very few or very few SMEs involved here. So possibly, you know, someone, a vendor was chosen on price or some other, uh, some other aspect that uh, without having the right level of expertise in place. Uh, probably there was very little automation in place or proper setup or engineering. Uh, potentially the tools were not adequate to handle a real solid conversion. And again, a lot of times, too, conversion is done quickly with a very extensive cleanup on the back end, which is where typically more of the drain on time and, and resources takes place. Our process is quite different, so I would recommend you start looking at that. Uh, the lack of a defined process. You know, we are very methodical in our approach to every service we provide. So therefore, again, the controls that are put into place are, are really very finite and, and help to avoid a lot of these issues. No training before or after. Um, if you're moving to DITA, you absolutely have to have training. Um, and again, looking at the QA process, uh, QA is a manual process. It is lengthy, it is costly, and if you don't have the right process in place on the front end, you're going to have a dreadful time QAing, not to mention that you can't really QA your own stuff. So that's another issue to look at. Um, lastly, I will tell you, and again, without I'm trying to avoid sounding self-serving, but I know it seems practical on uh, many um, levels to convert your own materials. I can promise you it never saves you time, and it most definitely never, ever saves you money. It seems like it should, but it does not. And having a good, solid team of pros on your side is going to be the most cost-effective way of getting that quality output that you're, you're looking for. So sorry for uh, the, the soapbox, but it's not It's you? not at all, Linda. I can tell you that we at Vassant feel a lot better when we are working with a client that we know has engaged DCL okay, to do their conversions because we know we're going to get a consistency and quality of, of end content product that's going to speed our deployment, smooth it out, make sure that it really works as, as intended. Most of the suboptimal CCMS deployments that we come across have many of these same symptoms that you just discussed. So, exactly. Uh, and you we, know what else, We Jim? second that by emotion. The, by the time you're at implementation stage, the last thing you need are tons of errors in the content because it is going to throw everything into complete havoc. So. Yep. OK. Question four. Can structured content produce the same ROI without using a CCMS? <laughs> Can I take a stab at this one, Linda? Uh, of I'll, course. This is Jim, and I'll just say, frankly, no. Uh, we really do think that uh, that if you're going to have a a structured content environment, a data, or, or what have you, uh, you're going to need to have a, a component content management system. And I guess the easiest way is to, is, um, is to think of that as kind of an air traffic controller for your content operations. So everything, workflows, schedules, workloads of individuals, making sure that the particular chunks of content are routed to the appropriate subject matter experts based on their expertise. Um, it acts as a directory of, of uh, multiple people and tools, a kind of a nexus, if you will, uh, to, to help make sure that you're moving towards your goal of great content delivery. Uh, so you could do it, but uh, 
you know, the appropriate tools make it really, really worthwhile. So. You know, all I'm going to say is ditto, ditto, ditto. I mean, it totally defeats the purpose of building a really true, in the truest sense, uh, a reliable content management strategy. There just are no shortcuts allowed. You know, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to achieve what you need to achieve without putting all of the proper uh, tools built specifically for your content in place. It's really that simple. Okay. Moving on to question five. What are some real life examples of how structured content processes have improved overall quality assurance for services, products, or overall company activity? Um, I can give you a couple of uh, examples. I, I'm going to make them um, anonymized, if you will, blind examples. I don't want to reference the particular client's name. I know, Linda, you have that same kind of concern for non disclosure Correct. NDAs, NDAs, NDAs. Yep. yep. Exactly. Having said that, uh, I can give you a couple of specific examples, a little anecdotes. Uh, one, we had a client that uh, worked with highly technical content, uh, and they had four or five writers uh, that were in one room. So it was not a big, diverse, um, dispersed organization. Uh, and what they found is that this uh, the utilizing of these techniques allowed them to parse, parse and prioritize uh, their content so that it was routed to the particular areas of expertise of their particular individuals for tasking and workflow management. Uh, they also, as a result of doing that, their quality went up measurably. Uh, they did have translation requirements, and of course that saved them a ton of time and a ton of cost, uh, but they also reduced their cycle times from two years to two months. Another example is a, a global healthcare provider, let's say, and this is a true story, uh, they had uh, upwards of 600 doctors uh, as their uh, subject matter authors. Now, these folks didn't know structured content, they didn't know DITA, they didn't know XML, and they weren't going to know it. Uh, they knew hemoglobin and, you know, blood counts. Uh, but the ability to uh, provide tools that allow them on a web basis to capture and author their, their content and to then keep that whole flow of content editing and uh, publishing working uh, effectively and cost effectively it was very, very useful. By the way, these folks are located all around the globe. Uh, and one other last example wasn't from us, but another uh, client, uh, excuse me, consultant that we work with uh, tells a story of, of, a, of a company that had uh, a 250-page HR manual. But because of their particular global operations and their different divisions, uh, that single base manual had evolved into this 36 edition beast. And there are 36 different renditions of this manual that they had to deal with and, and translate into multiple languages, et cetera. The bottom line is it took them six months to do it. Uh, they went in and kind of said, well, what would, what would taking this from uh, a data excuse me, from a, a document approach to a structured content approach do for us. And they were able to take a six-month cycle down to a one-week cycle and basically derive all 36 flavors, if you will, like Baskin and Robbins from that one structured content iteration. So very useful. Definitely. Um, you know, I have part of the issue I have as well, uh, obviously, is, is not being able to mention specific case studies, but uh, of which we have numerous ones, as does the Sant. Uh, but I would recommend that you check out our recent webinar. Uh, it's up on dclab.com in the archived webinar section entitled Getting Change to Happen, moderated by Dr. Joanne Hackos. And it featured two specific case studies. One was Xylem and one was Varian Medical. So I think it would give you uh, a pretty good indication of the types of efficiencies that get built in. The more efficient 
your uh, process is, obviously the higher quality of service and actual uh, documentation you're going to be able to, uh, to serve to your, your clients both inside and out. But, you know, the quick answer really is that um, the structure, the better structured content improves really every aspect of your organization's uh, workflow, um, your teams working together. There's a lot more ability to collaborate, so on and so forth. Um, I can tell you in one other instance, uh, one, one particular service I can talk about is really being able to identify um, redundancies and setting up standard best practices that come from those redundancies because the fewer times that information needs to be rewritten or served uh, in some different format, um, the more likely you are to have, obviously, errors occur, inconsistencies, so on and so forth. So if you're talking you know, really about the quality assurance side of your documentation, setting up best practices, to, you know, having the flexibility of the structured content model and being able then to push it versus, you know, uh, redoing it or having to touch it again is going to really allow for uh, fewer errors and whatnot to occur. Um, but, but frankly speaking, it really is virtually impossible to remain competitive and supply the highest level of accuracy without a really good structured content process in place. Yep. Great. Okay, question six. What does our team need to do to move legacy content to data? How much does it cost to convert, and what are the potential savings? <laughs> okay, I'm going to jump in on this one. Go um, ahead. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jim. <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to say this question most definitely does need its own webinar. So, Suzanne, please make a note of that, because for 2013, we have to make sure we address this. Um, you know, I, I guess the very first thing I need to say here is that you need to hire the experts and you need to start the process early rather than later. As you know from, if you've attended any of our webinars before, you get our newsletter, you see we work with uh, some of the top consultants in the industry um, that can really help you get things going. We find that when we have these people in place, and Jim, I'm, I'm sure you're going to concur with this, that working in collaboration and having all of these partners really holding your hand through the course of this process, you're going to end up with an implementation that's not necessarily flawless, but as close to it as possible. Um, you know, you, you, many times, too, the legacy content becomes more of an afterthought. It really needs to be at the forefront of the process. I, I can't stress that enough. enough. But cleaning up the content, identifying the redundancies early, being able to, you know, get the content really streamlined, um, prioritize. So prioritize what content you're going to move first. Which is the most critical to your business long term? Do you produce products that uh, have a long shelf life and clients are still out there? We have, a, a, you know, customers who um, uh, even in uh, machinery uh, manufacturers who customers now require documentation because they're collecting older machines oh versus God. actually employing them. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, move only what is really relevant to the business. You know, um, don't waste time and resources on moving stuff that's going to be passe in a year. It, it's just not worth it. Um, but excellent. just please do not even dream of going at this alone. And it doesn't mean you have to turn all the responsibility over to the pros. Maybe you build some kind of hybrid process uh, with having the, the experts there to help you and guide you. 
Um, you know, we also have addressed some of the areas of savings previously, but um, uh, reusability, consistency, efficiency, enhanced e-delivery for multiple requirements, uh, you know, supporting internal and external customers, so on and so forth. And lastly, I'm not avoiding the question of how much does it cost to convert, but I have to tell you, it really does depend. And the more preparation and whatnot is done on the front end, the easier and the less expensive the whole conversion process is going to be. Um, but the most expensive one is going to be the one that really gets fouled up in the midst of it. Um, and it has to be redone. It, exactly. I mean, I, I'll tell you, we had a project, this was, I guess, about two years ago, that had a very critical timeline to it. We didn't start the process. Uh, I'll leave that uh, you know, to your imagination. But nonetheless, we were had a couple hundred thousand pages of critical documentation that required an extremely high level of accuracy in the output dropped on us with 10 weeks to go. We delivered it on time. So I don't know how you put a price tag on that. I don't know how you put an ROI on that. All I can say is without that deadline being met, uh, met this particular organization would have lost a boatload of money. So enough okay. said. Excellent. <laughs> All right, question seven. We have handled the conversion of small data sets ourselves in the past, but have experienced a lot of errors in the output. How can we best avoid errors when converting our content in the future? Well, I guess this is another one for me to jump into, but uh, very yep. similar, obviously. Uh, you hire the pros. You don't go it alone. So you really get the expertise you need to help to avoid, uh, avoid this. You know, um, I guess my first question would be is how um, how long did it take you to really do what you did? And was it more time consuming to try to clean up the stuff, first of all, identify all the errors, and then clean it up on the back end than it was actually converting it on the front end? So, you know, process is critical. Um, and it is virtually impossible to QA your own content. We do a lot of independent QA projects, by the way, for um, other people's, uh, other vendors' conversion projects, as well as uh, self-converted content. So just don't even think about doing that part of it on your own. You're, you're going to miss a ton of stuff. You're going to find you're going to keep going back and back and back and back across the, uh, the documentation. Um, it's all about process. You know, it's set up, it's the tools. Um, in any given conversion uh, project, we probably have somewhere in the range of 11, 12, 13 very unique steps that we build into the process. We have multiple checkpoints at each one of those steps to make sure that things are getting converted properly, that uh, everything is matching the need of, of, of what that output has to perform. Um, and, you know, tools. I mean, we might employ anywhere from seven to nine or ten different tools during the course of a conversion project. So if you think about doing this on your own, what things do you have available to you? Um, you know, but avoiding errors in the output has to do with avoiding issues and mistakes and missteps in your process early on. So, Suzanne? Excellent. Okay. There we go. Um, question eight. How do you ask for budget in a down economy? This is a good one. It is a good one. Uh, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, first of all, you have to actually, if you're asking for budget for a project like this, you've got to believe in the benefits of the project. You really have to believe in it, and you have to sell those benefits uh, within your organization. Bear in mind that if you're uh, com requesting capital spend, you're competing with your other divisions, colleagues, other co-workers, and uh, ex uh, other folks 
for that available capital. So you need to make your business case better, crisper, faster than the next person. Also bear in mind that when you're making your business case, uh, be cognizant of the audience to whom you are presenting. For example, uh, go to the head of your technical publications department. Uh, the important points to that person might be, hey, improve cycle times and, uh, and workflow efficiencies. If you are, on the other hand, then got past that hurdle and got to the CFO's office with the executive committee, they might be interested in, in much more financially centric uh, it points, uh, tend to be at a higher level, tend to be a little bit less detailed, but you have to be prepared to drill down. And it also helps uh, it, to put things in terms of the cost of doing nothing. Because what you're doing today is not free. Even though you haven't spent money on technologies or uh, processes or, or both, mm -hmm. uh, your current operation mode of operating is fraught with uh, can be fraught with inefficiency and it is expensive. So that's the the point I would make. That is a very good point, Jim. <laughs> you know, I think I think you know when we talked about this, I think it was in slide two or three about ROI. Uh, you know, we talked about the hidden costs. Those hidden costs are really what are draining your organization. And to be, be frank, I can't think of a better time to ask for a budget than in a down economy. By just looking for the waste that exists in your process today, I guarantee you are bleeding resources human, financial, otherwise. There are ways these individuals and could, could be working more effectively. There, there are ways that you could use your, your um, financial backing more effectively, so on and so forth. Um, as Jim said, building a team of stakeholders to help you on this mission, um, having them, helping them pass the fear of you know, well, wait a minute. What are you? What are you going after? And what are you trying to do? And what are you trying to say? And I earn my keep, and all of those types of things will be important. Um, uh, actually, not to to get off track for a second, but I will tell you in our newsletter that's going out in December, I happened to write a short article on on helping change to occur within organizations, and I think this is one area where you know that really is critical. Uh, don't hide the grim reality. I mean, you're going to lose market share without providing flexible content. And I know that a lot of com organizations, you know, it, it is when they have, have realized that fact that they actually know they have no choice but to make the move and to get that budget. How do you put a price tag on that, you know? And the lastly, I would say that, you know, Obviously, it's upper management that most often approves the budget, but you know they really oftentimes have very little insight into what your issues are on a day-to-day -day basis. Where are you draining your resources? How could a more efficient process, a more effective process, uh, you know, really help to save the organization a considerable amount of money? So, yeah, you might have to write a check in in you know, the forefront, but it isn't going to take long for you to recoup that. But now is the time. So. Well said. Excellent. Okay. Question nine. Over the years, our content has become rather convoluted due to many different writers and styles. We're now thinking about starting from scratch and just rewriting it without our, with our new data structure. At what point does this become more cost effective? Interesting question. Do you? I don't. I don't have. In, do you have any insight into that, Linda? You know, it's rare that this approach is cost effective. Um, obviously, it's highly dependent on the industry and the amount of content that you have. But I think you have to ask yourself what is involved in my current process. Um, rewriting does not fix the primary issues that right. most organizations right. uncover. You know. Um, it only compounds them, actually. Uh, obviously, QA is critical. Pre- and post-conversion process being more efficient. You know, there are lots of ways that that we could um, 
push this one to uh, to help your 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 thought processes uh, clean up again. You know, I keep going back to the same uh, factors, but they they really play such a strong part in all of this. Uh, but I think the cleanup can help you to repair your content so the conversion is easier and obviously saves a lot of time from rewriting it all. But the rewriting is still going to create inconsistencies. It's still going to, you know, it, it just isn't going to fix it. Um, so I would say, you know, what I would recommend would be to really build a, a standard structure and better rules for your organization. Set best practices for the future. Kind of future-proof your content, if you will, for reuse. Uh, allow for more tools to support the process and enforce your standards more easily with better automated validation. And it also build, that builds organizational expertise Absolutely. within your uh, writing group. And that in and of itself will make you and your fellows more valuable. If you, uh, we we've seen a number of folks that have, you know, raised their their relative value to their organization by becoming truly expert in this area. So I mean, I will say also, Jim. You know, we have had some clients that that was the approach we recommended. You know, because a lot of the content wasn't necessarily important to the business long term. You know, all of the stuff we've already discussed. But uh, yep. you know, there are going to be rare instances where it it may make sense. But again, having a consultant, a pro on your side to be able to provide you with the level of expertise that pertains to your industry, your workflow, your content is going to really get you closer to answering that question. Yep. Okay. Question 10, what is the best information basis that I can develop in order to keep track or determine pro progress when migrating legacy content to structured content? Jim, do you want me to jump in? I mean, I do. You know, we, <laughs> be great. We've, ta we've talked a lot about this already. Um, you know, it's all in the process, folks. There, there really is no quick or easy way around that. You need to establish a very well-defined process early on. As I said earlier, ours here incorporates more than 11 unique steps with multiple checkpoints, so on and so forth. Um, assign tasks and stick to your plan. Um, set up those multiple checkpoints so that you can do the QA throughout versus you know, having to, to try to do it all on the back end, which is all manual, by the way, at that stage. Uh, so that's where um, certainly you can end up in a lot of trouble. Um, allow for parallel comparisons along the way. That, you know, it doesn't have to be one or the other. It, it, many times these, these processes flow in unison. Um, know where all the information resides at any given moment. Uh, not so simple unless your plan, you know, incorporates that, that really defined process. Uh, we happen to utilize um, what we call a production tracking system. So it enables every member of our team to see real-time status. There are no duplications of effort. Uh, anybody who touches that content for any reason needs to log it into the PTS. So if you can somehow set up some sort of system like that, you'll save yourself a lot. But the reality is you need to leave it to the pros. Okay. Yeah, we, uh, we're going to reiterate that. I will say that uh, Vasant is very big on jointly developed detailed statement of, statements of work. And by jointly developed, we develop it with our clients and get mutual buy-in on some clearly identified stage gates so that everybody knows where we are, how much budget we've consumed, are we on target. Uh, no surprises. That's, that's the goal, no surprises. All right, we'll move on to question 11. I need to take a big breath for this one. <laughs> we use structured content, or XML, for developing our operating manuals. However, we currently only render to PDF. A lot of our users now have iPads and utilize the GoodReader app to sync our servers to our servers and download their PDF manuals. 
there are limitations with PDF in terms of searching across more than one document and linking between documents. However, for a mobile device such as an iPad, is there an HTML option or app out there which allows users to download and sync HTML docs so that the data can be accessed offline? Um, I'm going to jump in here because I was the one who really fought to keep this question in. Uh, it doesn't really apply specifically to the value of structured content per se. However, having said that, there are many, many, many limitations to PDF with searching being only one of them. So while there are organizations that PDF, having all of your content in PDF might make sense, uh, most cases uh, it's it's really going to become more and more difficult as, obviously, um, more devices and whatnot uh, come to the marketplace that don't render PDF very well. But getting to the point of this question, uh, it's really better to render in, in some other format um, for e-readers in particular, although regardless of the format, uh, you know, there, there really isn't any way you can search on an iPad. You can create libraries. Um, you can create links within the PDF for ease of flow from one to another. But, the, you know, the, the reality is the, the device itself is going to control this. Now, having said that, it is fairly straightforward to build a lightweight uh, container app for iPad that would support the features mentioned and interface directly with the XML via an API to the mothership, if you will. Notice I said XML. This is why this question is still in here, because again, it's the XML, it's the structured content that really brings the flexibility you need. With that flexibility comes tremendous value for your organization. So, you know, Yes, you can create apps. They work, are going to work much better with your content if you have it structured appropriately. So, Jim, I don't know if you uh, have anything else to add to that one. No, I, I think that's you, you're on top of that, and I think that's, that helps. Okay. Question 12. What are some strategies to wean PDF-dependent users to HTML and other outputs? Uh, you know, okay, Jim, if you don't mind, I'm just going to jump in here again. Um, I guess my first question would be, is your problem that your customers all only want PDF, which I highly doubt, by the way, or that you only provide your content in PDF? Um, I think it's important to, to really understand that we live in a highly mobile society. And while you're going to have people who are probably never going in their lifetime to wean themselves off of PDF, most of us will. And you know what, what we really are recommending today, uh, obviously like, you know, EPUB isn't a, isn't a content strategy per se, but being able to create multiple e-deliveries that brings your content to the eyes of any user on any device at any given moment is really the key here. XML helps you to provide that flexibility. Because once it's in the XML, A, you can chunk out what needs to go for a particular user group. But B, it's much easier to go to different formats um, than strictly looking at PDF. I mean, PDF creates all kinds of issues. There's, there's no two ways about it. And as I said earlier, it is uh, certainly appropriate for, for certain instances. But, um, you know, if you're thinking you're going to do the weaning, that just isn't going to happen. What's going to happen is your users, your customers, your internal folks are going to be weaning you guys off of them. Yeah, and they're not going to, and they're not going to tell you, Linda. No. They're just going to no, do it. They're just going to go away. You. They're just going to either right. go away or do it. Exactly. Um, right, but, so. you know, I think it's hard to, I, you, you can't predict what process someone is going to use to access your content. You just have to be able to provide it. And, you know, one other thing I would, would clearly recommend, if you have not done this already, is to conduct a customer usability study. 
I think you might be amazed at what you find. But nonetheless, if you publish the results, others will follow along, you know, because we're all creatures of, of our own habits, but we like other people's habits too. Uh, but I think, you know, lastly here, uh, time is going to cure this issue because it's going to become increasingly more difficult to interact with PDF on various devices. So even those of us who may be totally wedded to them are going to be forced to look at other, other ways to, uh, to receive our, our needed content. Yep. Okay. Very good. We're going to move on here. Uh, we're getting a little short on time. Um, question 13. How do I determine which conversion team and CCMS is the right fit for my organization? Uh, I'll give you uh, two seconds of uh, our, our two cents on that from the component content management perspective. Uh, we believe very strongly that there's, there's a lot of different content management systems out there. Uh, a component content management system is very different from something like a document management system or other vanilla types of tools. Uh, and oftentimes folks fall into the trap of focusing on features. Feature this is a feature that, and you know, chasing features. Features are important, but in this, these deployments are very complex. They are very, um, they require a great amount of interaction between the software provider, i.e. Vizant or whoever, and you, the client company. So you, I would suggest that you take a look and, and insist on uh, examining the references uh, of, of a provider, especially the successful deployments and the unsuccessful ones if you can find them. Uh, and the last I would say is really pays to uh, focus on the depths of the customer service and consulting bench that anybody has to to offer to you as an organization, because at the end of the day, that more than features will will make a difference in terms of uh, the the relative likelihood of success in achieving your your business goals. Yeah, uh, right on, Jim. I mean, I I can answer this one really quickly. Your content is your organization's most valuable asset. It drives everything that happens within that organization, and most importantly, selling product or service. Would you just, in that case, trust it to anyone? Um, you know, I, it's not a. This is not a commodity. Neither CMS conversion. It's those are not commodities. They are really significant parts of your organization's ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis. So, I mean, I don't know how much more to say, really, in this regard, but there's no more cost-effective means to the end than getting it done right the first time. And you, yep. you need to do your homework, but you have to invest appropriately because you need the expertise that it takes to drive these types of processes forward. Okay. I agree. Question 14. What are uh, tools and techniques to support initial and ongoing conversion from Word to data? Lynn, I'll take you, <laughs> let you take a stab <laughs> at that one. Okay. Um, you know, it's highly Maybe that's a... The con huh? No. I was just yeah, going to say maybe I, I, that is probably better for another. Yeah, it definitely, definitely is. All I'm going to say is it's highly, highly dependent on the content, the quality, and otherwise. So you really have to have a complete analysis performed by an objective expert, by the way, before proceeding right. on your own or otherwise. We'll be happy to discuss your particular issues offline. You can certainly uh, uh, contact either myself or Jim and... Um, you know, we'll be happy to work you, walk you through it. Okay. And question 15, our writers are geographically dispersed across multiple time zones. How can your tools help with colleagues or subject matter experts located all over the place, reviewers that cannot see what other reviewers are saying, and finding the right content when needed? Um, you know, Jim, I'm just going to just make a quick statement here and then, you know, turn this really over to you. But, uh, you know, content is critical. 
it drives everything, as we've talked about throughout this, this uh, particular webinar session. Uh, the structure of the content will enable much more collaboration, collaboration and certainly much more globalization. The tools then support the content. So, you know, I think That's many right. times we find our clients putting, I hate to use the old analogy, the carpet for the horse, but it's not about the tools. It's about your content. And from there, everything else uh, falls into place. So Jim, I, 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 I was going to use chicken that. and egg. Okay, <laughs> we're just sort of cliches today. <laughs> but uh, that, uh, we, I agree completely. Uh, all of the wonderful, rich capabilities of a solution like Vessant or similar robust global content management solution can only be brought to bear if you've got your content right. If you do, then these tools can do some really wondrous things for your efficiency, uh, your cost effectiveness, and your capacity to generate world-class content. But without content structure and quality, you're kind of uh, up the creek without a paddle. So another cliche, perfect. <laughs> there you go. Nothing like nothing like ending on a cliche, right, Lynn? <laughs> I love it. Too. Okay. And we are right up against the hour, so we aren't going to have time to address any further questions. Um, but we will take those questions and incorporate them into our future webinars next year. Um, we can plan to continue the Ask Us About series next year, um, probably on a quarterly basis. So please watch your email inboxes for those uh, invitations to join us. And uh, uh, we have our contact information on the screen if you want to submit any further questions for us to address in those future webinars. And uh, we would like to thank everyone for joining us today. We hope you found this really valuable. I think we had a lot of good answers to the questions and a lot of good questions submitted by our audience. So please continue to submit them, and uh, we'll, we'll discuss those in future webinars. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day.